Hello everybody. Uh, this was originally going to be an essay, but I needed so many examples that I decided to make it a video. So we're going to have a video instead. You'll have to pardon uh, the roughness of my voice and the loud sounds in the background. And we'll just get straight on into examples. Engineering gaps is a kind of complicated concept, and I'm going to have to teach it just by uh, starting with examples and, and letting the concept emerge from them. So if we talk about a game like Minecraft, they put certain voxels into the game because they knew that you would want them. So you've got doors and chests and bookshelves and they are discrete modules. You just put them in the game and they work. There's also a couple of other objects like redstone dust and redstone torches and touch pads, you know, uh, pressure pads, which don't really have any function on their own. You have to connect them up in complicated ways. Now in the beginning, this was basically all that the redstone had. Later on they added in a whole bunch of additional stuff, uh, programmable blocks and repeaters and so on, but in the beginning it was just these guys. Now these go in two different directions. Players that uh, start using these will generally go in the direction of building their own little houses and castles and stuff, uh, however they please and decorate them with those blocks and it's an aesthetic challenge where they have to choose the layout of the castle and create all the pieces that they want and put it all together and it's a very smooth curve because you can go from creating a house to creating a mansion to creating a castle to creating a world and you can just spend as much time as you'd like on any individual stage of it uh, but it is just an aesthetic practice there's no reason that you actually need most of these things um, in terms of the in-game functionality once you have enough chests to store your stuff and enough doors to keep the monsters out, there's not really any need for any additional ones. Now the other half of this is the redstone stuff. If you take the redstone stuff, you can create you know, massive, massive 10,000 mile worlds that allow you to do basic calculations, you know, And I'm sure you remember these guys. Uh, recently, a word processor was created, and it, you know, is a mountain of, of redstone. Now, the point I want to make is that if you go this way, the curve is nice and easy. It's like, okay, well, yeah, you're building a house, you're building a, uh, you're building a base, you're building a mansion, you're building a castle. You just keep going up until you get tired of it. But the problem is that this also has a cap. Uh, up here is when you realize that it's all just aesthetic. And at that point, you stop playing Minecraft, and you start just do voxel painting, uh, which is certainly fine, but it's not really Minecraft, even if it's rendered in Minecraft. Over here, we have the opposite problem. There is just this cliff, and then it goes up. And this cliff is the, mine the, 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 the way you would use redstone in the game, because redstone takes a lot of work and doesn't produce anything in the game so if you want to have a door that opens when you step on the pad you've got to do mines this redstone uh, finagling and it takes a lot of work and it's not significantly easier when you're done than just opening the door using a click and that's true of all the redstone stuff uh, creating an elevator is less easy than just using a ladder and that sort of stuff so in the end you end up using redstone you're trying to use redstone to create aesthetic results you know, you want to make the rooms light up when you walk in or whatever. And uh, these aesthetic results require a massive amount of redstone and expertise, even though they produce a minor aesthetic result. And if you, when you finally get over the aesthetic hump and you start to get into actual functionality that you want to try and do, that's just this massive gap. There is this huge, huge wall, uh, and it's hard to pursue. And that's why so few people are... Um, redstone experts although recently it's gotten a little bit better because the idea of the trains and so on you can uh, not the trains the uh, mine carts and so on they all get integrated in together and you can do some cool stuff there uh, monster traps using redstone are fun too but in the beginning it was really rough so let's talk about it from a slightly different angle let's talk about space engineers now, if you haven't played Space Engineers, it's a slightly more complicated building game. It, it has a lot more um, stuff that's required when you're building. So, for example, if you want to build a spaceship, you have to stick engines on that face every given direction so that you can maneuver in any given direction. 
But the engine modules themselves are very basic. Uh, they, they just are these self-contained modules. You don't have to wire them up to anything. Once they're attached to the ship, they just work. Uh, similarly, the uh, generators just work. You can put them anywhere on the ship, and they will send electricity to anywhere on the ship. You don't have to wire them up. Just like with Minecraft, recently Space Engineers has been getting a lot of upgrades where connectivity is becoming something that you have to focus on so that you've got conveyor belts and such. But in the beginning, uh, the point was that these modules all come just ready to go. And similarly, you get yourself a cockpit, you put it in the ship, and it doesn't matter where it is, it doesn't have to be hooked up to anything, it just works. And this is a result of the, div the devs looking at their game and going, well, if we want to let the players make spaceships, we've got to give them engines, so here's an engine. We've got to give them a uh, generator, so here's a generator. And rather than having to worry about wiring all that together, you just stick it all on the ship and it all just works regardless of what you do, as long as it, the basic idea is correct. The engines are pointed the right direction, for example. But you can also move around by using gravity drives. Gravity drives are a much more complicated feature. Um, so you have like a gravity generator, and then you've got these mass blocks, these artificial mass blocks, which can be turned on and off. And basically, even though they're both attached to the same, same ship, uh, when this gravity drive is turned on, these mass blocks get pushed, and the whole ship moves, even though the gravity source is actually on the ship as well. So these gravity drives can move your ship around. But it's actually quite an interesting engineering challenge because the mass blocks have to be along the center of mass. Uh, if I were to build my ship with some stuff out here, then my ship would actually spin as I was trying to move forward. And while this isn't a huge deal if you're just going forward and you can just build yourself a mirrored ship, what happens if you want to move right so if you move right, then if your mass blocks are in the nose, and those are the ones being affected by your rightward gravity field, then your ship will turn as you're moving right. And so it's an engineering consideration. It, it produces some very complicated results. Now, the results are actually very, very complex. You have to do a lot of rather excessive engineering to use gravity drives in anything other than just a straightforward way. Um, it's especially complicated because you have to actually know enough to turn on uh, the gravity diagrams which is something that most players probably never even used. But in the end, it is possible to create a ship that moves around without any engines. And in fact, done properly, it actually, for large ships, is more um, energy efficient by quite a bit. So uh, that's always going to be fun. You're creating a better var variant for your ship, but of course it's not linked in with your WSAD controls or any of that stuff, uh, so it's not as easy to use. The point I'm trying to make here is that this is actually a smooth curve. Once you realize that it's possible, you can build your ship so that it goes forward with the gravity drive, and then you can build it so that it can go forward and backwards with the gravity drive, and then you can build it so that it, it uses the gravity drive to move left and right, and then up and down, and then you can build it so that it turns with the gravity drive, and there's this very clear um, progression in theory. Most people don't use gravity drives because they're not, they're not advantageous enough to worry about, but uh, uh, the the curve is very very smooth. Whereas over here, when you got the engines, it's like okay, you understand how engines work, and then you're done. Now, Space Engineers also has um, uh, aesthetic stuff. You can build yourself a, uh, a a space base that theoretically you could wander around inside. But the system has no the the. The, the game has no concept of pressurized areas or life support or any of that stuff, so it's all just make-believe, and it's all just aesthetic, just like building a castle in, in, uh, in Minecraft. But Minecraft doesn't have this. Minecraft does not have uh, a smooth curve for some kind of engineering solution. And this is the missing piece in almost every game. Now, I don't think that this is an ideal situation because it has a little bit of uh, difficulty in it that shouldn't be there. It has it has a kind of an initial, an initial spike that you'd want to try and avoid if you can. But there is an alternative. Uh, so let's consider a variant of Minecraft. We're going to go back to Minecraft here. So Minecraft has these doors. We're looking down on a door from above, okay? And then here's the voxel border, and here's the door. Now when the door opens, it pivots to the side like this. So when it's like this, you can't pass through, it, it, you know, like this, but you can pass through like this. And it's the opposite when it's closed. Um, I actually don't remember whether or not open doors 
actually block you. It may be that open doors just have no um, no collision at all. I can't remember, but for our for our purposes, this is how it works. Um, so this is how doors in Minecraft work, and the door object is an actual standalone two voxel object, uh, which has a specific display. But let's pretend that instead of that, we have a function. We have a function we can apply to any block called the pivot function. So we can take any block and we can just using a, a crafted object, which, you know, a hinge that you craft out of a couple of metal pieces. Using a hinge, you apply it to the object and now it can rotate 90 degrees when you activate it and rotate backwards when you activate it again. And so anything can be turned into a door. You can still build the door. Uh, so, you know, you build yourself a, a, a flat object like this, a flush barrier like this, and then it hinges open and it hinges shut, and it, it works fine. You can also do things like uh, hinge redstone circuits to create uh, variations there. You can hinge beds so that they go from being upright to being sideways so you can stow them. Uh, you can do all sorts of stuff like uh, the if you hinge it so that it's a um, uh, floor traps, I forget what they're called all of a sudden. Uh, you know, doors on the floor can be opened upwards or downwards depending on how you hinge them. You can get yourself some windows in your walls that actually extend out when you open them. And uh, uh, you can do a whole bunch of basic stuff here, but the power here is that you can choose what blocks to hinge and how to hinge them. And the pivot, therefore, is a lot, uh, is, is quite powerful. So the other piece of this puzzle is that if you have something that is arranged, let's say that we're looking at a voxel here. Um, so we've got a voxel, and it's a standard door voxel, so it's one of these flush barriers like this. Uh, and we attach a hinge, and so this, this will open and close. If we put another voxel on top of it, and we attach a hinge on the same axis, then when you activate one of them, they both activate at the same time. And that's how you would create the doors. Now, obviously, there would be a door object that you could create, which would just be these two things stacked on top of each other and automatically hinged. You wouldn't absolutely have to do this manually every single time. But because you allow people to do it manually, there are a whole bunch of additional things you can do. For example, you can make a door that is as much high as you'd like it to be. You don't have it to be exactly two. Uh, if you put it horizontally, you can create uh, sluice gates that are quite long, or you can create bridges that can open, that can that can fall open or close up. Um, you can do a lot of cool things with this. Let light in with your long shutters. With relatively small changes, you could actually make it so that uh, these could let water through or sand through or other things. In Minecraft, as it stands, I don't believe that opening a door actually lets the water through, but the same basic idea applies. Uh, redstone circuitry, of course, could be a lot of fun like this, uh, but you would have to change some of the rules as to how the redstone gets laid down. So the basic idea of door goes from being a uh, one-off to being an instance of a rule. And this allows the players to do a lot more engineering feats with that same thing. For example, um, if we had a bookshelf, and maybe the bookshelf has functions in it where you can uh, put, put books in with secret memos and, and all that sort of thing. So you've got yourself a secret bookshelf. Well, you can have it face the wall so no one can read it. So here's your hidden little bookshelf in the wall there. And then you can have it so that the hinge can only be activated by a redstone switch somewhere. And when you activate it, it rotates, and now it's facing outwards and can be read. And that's just a sort of minor thing you can do with this that would be, um, you know, kind of fun and interesting. Uh, now, we're using Minecraft rules because that's kind of what I brought up, but it would also be very easy to make this pivot work in uh, a different way. So right now we've got it so that it just rotates within its voxel. That doesn't really make any sense for anything larger than a door, but uh, we can also make it so that if you have something that's pivoted, rather than rotate within its voxel, it rotates to the neighbor voxel. So in this case, let's say that we have a bookshelf like this, and there are the books down there. And we rotate it, it would actually move into this voxel and be pointing this way. 
And in that way, it would actually clear out this voxel entirely. And when you start to do this sort of thing, you can start to build really interesting mechanical machines. Um, and, uh, and especially if you start to combine it with other factors. For example, you could have an edge connect, or I guess it would be a face connect. You could have a face connect option. So in this case, uh, when you apply something, if you're putting down bricks, normally speaking, uh, they don't have any kind of specific attachment point. They just occupy a voxel spot in space. But there's no reason that you can't say, okay, well, I'm actually affixing it to this surface right here, this one here. So this voxel that I'm affixing right now, it's actually tethered to that surface and not to the ground or to space in general. So if this guy moves, then this guy moves with him. And that sort of thing is relatively easy with modern generations of voxel engines. Uh, and it would allow you to do a lot more complicated sort of um, construction tools and a lot of more complicated machines and have a lot more fun with it. And you can combine them. So you can have, well, this guy is a pivot and this guy is attached to his face, so I've got this door that's too wide and it swings open just fine. Um, by attaching these ideas to the game engine rather than to a specific module, we can allow the player to grow. We can give them a smooth curve up into the areas they want to do, um, they, they want to go, and that would allow them to play around. So what I'm saying is that right now we have this approach where the devs go, what does the player want? What do we want to give the player? What do we want to give the player? Well, we want to give him an engine, so he, we will want him to be able to move around in space, we'll give him an engine. We want him to be able to turn his ship, so we'll give him something that affects the turning of his ship. We want to give him something that creates power, so let's create a power module. Uh, you know, We want him to be able to pilot his ship, so let's create a piloting module. Uh, we want him to be able to uh, store objects, so let's create an inventory module. You just get these modules, because the developers have thought of these pieces of functionality that they, they want to give the player. But Let's switch over to space engineers and let's talk about engines again. So we're we're using these ridiculous uh, gravity engines, as I was talking about earlier, as our kind of alternative. But imagine that instead of having a standalone engine module, they instead had engine physics, and the physics would be um, whatever uh, the physics we would like. So there is a a chamber that fills up with gas, and there's a a reaction chamber and then there's a vent out uh, and that's what the engine get that's what that's what you get when you build default engine and you have to pipe in reaction gas and whatever um, whatever other connections we want to require but by breaking it up into modules we allow the player to actually create these modules individually as they would like so we would have uh, uh, any kind of setup we want if we wanted to have a vectorable engine we would create a reaction chamber and then we would create the explosive area and then we would have a gimbaling engine that could thrust in every any given direction that we wanted to thrust which would allow us to have a different kind of control over our ship tying that into our physical control over the ship our keyboard movement might be a little bit difficult and would require some finesse but the idea is still there and if we want to do it another way we could have uh, these, these pressurized gas where we build in this heavy gas uh, uh, pressure and instead of firing it through an explosive chamber, we could just vent it straight down a corridor or something similar, and that would create a wind tunnel. Uh, instead of using instead of using an explosive gas, we could use an accelerated particle system, where we fire accelerated particles down and straight into the vent. There's no need for an, a reaction chamber or any of that stuff. Um, there are a lot of things we can do with these basic physical rules that are not just uh, the default engine and this would allow us to create all sorts of advanced features not just advanced engines but things like pressurized areas inside the ship we could simulate the idea of a pressurized space by using this pressurized chamber and allowing people to actually enter into it and having air being the pressurized gas that rather than there rather than a fuel mixture um, we could do it with more complicated things as well there's no reason that it has to be um, just engines, and we could create traps where you get blasted by fire. Um, we can create smelting tools, maybe. There's a lot of options here for us to expand. We can create, and in order for us to do that, the developer has to say, well, I'd like the player 
what does the player want? I'd like the player to be able to fly around, so I'll give him an engine. But I'd also like the player to be able to make his own engine. So rather than just giving him an engine, I would like to give him an engine that is made up of components, and he can create the components individually. So you should be, instead of saying, here is an engine, you should say, well, I'm going to create an engine. Uh, dev engine number one is made of blueprint. All right, and you can select that blueprint from your drop-down list and stick it into the world wherever you'd like. This is the tool. This is the power behind the uh, engineering game. I used to think that what I wanted from an engineering game was more complexity. I used to think, I want to have to connect up the engines. I want to have to worry about heat. I want to have to worry about pressure. I want to have a hard time creating things. I want to be able to have a difficult time creating things. That's what I used to think. Now I realize that that what I really want is I want to have the ability to create difficult things rather than difficulty creating things. And that means that I have to be given enough tools to allow me to create things. Uh, now, Minecraft gives you a whole bunch of tools, of course, and you can end up creating uh, you know, your, your word processor in Minecraft. But the difficulty level is so high that, that it's unmanageable. And it shouldn't be, should not have that level of difficulty. Obviously, this part of the curve should exist, but what we need is a massive amount of stuff down here. And the way to do that is to make sure that the player can do many of the things that the dev did. Give your players piecemeal elements that they can readjust, recreate, tweak as they see fit, and they will go ahead and they will create uh, whatever they need to create. Now, the exact methods and the exact nature is going to vary based on your game, but I think that the idea is sound. So I'd like to think more about engineering gaps. I'd like to think more about when you're creating something, you need to think about what your players are going to do beyond what you can think of. So you create an engine, but what is beyond your engine? What else is out there? Even if you don't know what else is out there, you have to give the players rope. You have to let them go out into that space. And that's something that very, very few games allow us to do. Very, very few games have that programmed into them. Um, and most of them only have it in there by accident. That's it. I hope this was coherent. And goodbye.